Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's brown bag session um, about the way that climate change affects our health. Um, to start, I would like to acknowledge that the SQUIS does its work for Canadians from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish and Musqueam nations. Um, this acknowledgement is a reminder of the discriminatory, racist, and colonial practices that have had a lasting legacy and continue to create barriers for Indigenous people and communities in our city. In the next few days, I encourage you all to learn a little bit more about the land we live on and personalize your collection to the territories on which we have settled. Um, so having said that, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Her name is Cecilia Sierra Heredia. Um, and she's a lecturer at the Faculty of Health Sciences at SFU. Uh, she completed a master's in science in health sciences at SFU, a master in arts in measurements, evaluation and research methodology at UBC, and a bachelor of psychology of honor psychology at the National University of Mexico. Um, her research investigates why children develop allergies and asthma, linking our attitude towards climate change and aeroallergens to respiratory illnesses in childhood. Her work highlights the need to adjust our public health policies to face the imminent respiratory health challenges awaiting us in the face of climate change. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Cecilia to begin her presentation. Thank you so much, Adele, for this introduction, and thank you, Christine, for the invitation. I'm honored to share this space with you and to be one of the guest speakers in, in this amazing community. So let me share my screen first. Okay. Hope it's working. Okay, so I'm sharing. So, uh, as, I, as Adele said, I will talk about how is climate change affecting our health. And I have to tell you, when I first started reading and talking about climate change, I used to talk about it in the future. How will climate change affect our health? And then I realized I had to change my verb tenses. It's already, right now, it's affecting our health. So that's why the title is in the present tense. We could even write it in the past tense, how it has been affecting our health. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what agency we have in here. What can we do about it? It's not just that we are having a passive role on it. We, we are active members of our environment. So we'll have a chance to discuss. This. So first things first, I, I wanted to share with you a little bit about me, and a little bit of story about who I am and how did I get where I am. So this is a, a cute picture, <laughs> sorry I couldn't help it. My, my mom loved it. It's a picture of me in my first school. I went to Montessori schools and I really think that being exposed to this philosophy shaped my engagement with science. Dr. Maria Montessori was the first female physician in Italy and after completing her medical degree, she went to, on to learn more about pedagogical practices, anthropology, and so many social sciences to develop this philosophy, this educational pedagogy that is very much grounded in the scientific method. It has a very systematic way of letting kids approach knowledge, of having adults guide them to their, their knowledge and the, the guides I had, the teachers I had uh, gifted me with an, an approach to science that it, I carry with me to this day and that I try to honor when I transmit science to my students. So uh, from then on, I started a bachelor's degree uh, in the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Goya, for those of you who are in the know. And uh, I loved my time there. I learned a lot about psychology. And I have to acknowledge my privilege because many members of my family are psychologists. So I had early exposure to this kind of expertise. I uh, wrapped up my studies a while ago. <laughs> and then in a kind of serendipitous way, I landed my first job in the field of uh, respiratory health. This picture is with the amazing members of the research team in the Clinic for Tobacco uh, Addiction at the National Institute for Respiratory Diseases in Mexico. 
And that's one of the first conferences I got to present my research at, fresh out of undergrad. And I learned so much from these wonderful women and from the men who led those teams that it motivated me to carry on research, to carry on, on the field of respiratory diseases and to see the value of interdisciplinary diseases. Many of these women were uh, physicians, pneumologists, many were psychologists as I was, and we also had respiratory therapists and social workers there. And it brought such a richness to the perspectives that I felt I really had to up my game and hone my research skills uh, in order to be a, a, an active contributor to this, to this group, right? So that's what I tried to do when I came to BC, to UBC, to do my research in, uh, in the Faculty of Education, that's a SCARF building. It has changed a lot in, since, since I graduated from there. And I had the opportunity to work with amazing mentors like Anita Hobley and Bruno Sumbo and all the members of the Faculty of Education really gave me um, an inclusive environment, embraced me as an international student and really showed me one of the most valuable traits of Canadian science. This approach of welcoming, right? Of letting everybody or many people, I guess I, I had a privileged opportunity to have a seat at the table. Then I went back to Mexico and I continued to work in issues with respiratory health, with tobacco, but more from a public health perspective. That picture is from one of the summer schools at the Johns Hopkins uh, University. I had the opportunity to attend when I was working with the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. And from then on, I discovered that I, I wanted to learn more about public health, but I worked as a lecturer for a while, almost a decade, at the La Salle University in, in a city called Cuernavaca. So that's a tongue twister. If you are able to say Cuernavaca quickly, it's, you're, you're good with Spanish, right? And then in Cuernavaca, I worked uh, as a lecturer in psychology, bridging the field of health psychology for my undergraduate and graduate students. But I, I kept this interest in public health, which is why I, I came back to Canada, this time with my family, to pursue my master's of science in SFU. And I convocated, I was lucky to have my in-person convocation last year. Uh, after wrapping up my thesis that did research in respiratory health, specifically in the field of environmental health, connecting everything around us, the air we breathe, with how our health uh, evolves throughout our lifetime, how the air we breathe shape our experiences in, in life. So where am I right now currently? As I said, I'm a lecturer here at the Faculty of Health Sciences. I'm working online for the most part with only uh, brief uh, periods of access to my office. That's Blueson Hall for those of you who are alumni of SPU, the, the faculty. And I'm also involved in activities that I really love in science outreach and knowledge translation activities. These pictures are from the, the online version of this year's Find of Science Canada and from the in-person last year's Science Slam Canada that was in Calgary as part of the Beakerhead Festival. And also as part of the Vancouver Steminist Book Club that uh, was organized by Annalise Hoffman. And I can tell you all of these activities enrich my practice and enrich my, my interaction with science in, in a way that I don't think I could get any, anywhere else. Keep an eye on, on this presenter, her name is Catherine Hayhoe, and it's, I got to meet her virtually, but in chat with her individually as part of my volunteering activities in Pint of Science. And she's one of the leading science communicators and leading experts in the field of climate change. So for me, that was uh, an amazing opportunity and, and a reward in and on itself, aside from all the cool things that happens on Pint of Science. So why do I, I spend this time and these activities talking about climate change. I think it's a key uh, event, a key phenomenon, a very complex problem. So I think it's worth talking about it, learning about it, and improving our environment to kind of mitigate what's going on with climate change. So that's the topic of 
the talk. And the outline of what I wanted to chat with you is, well, just get on a common ground of what is climate change. I think it has been on the news a lot, so it won't be the main part of the talk, but just getting on what is this global emergency about uh, is going to be the first part of the talk. Then, as I said, uh, there are three specific fields that I would like to discuss with you. The impacts of climate change on respiratory health, vector-borne diseases, infections, and mental health. We can't deny this gut feeling, this uh, feelings, thoughts, attitudes we have around this global emergency. So I'll, I'll devote a little bit of time about that. But I don't want to just leave things there. I also think we are active members of our environment. So that's why I'll wrap up talking about, and then what? What is in our future? What can be our role in this future? So in this continuum, this is a, a very powerful image. It's part of a campaign that's called show, hashtag show your stripes by Ed Hawkins. And each line represents the average temperature in a year. So using a, a system of colors where the, the deeper blues are cooler and the deeper reds are much warmer, we can see this progression from cooler temperatures that are warming up as time goes by. And this is the average temperatures worldwide. But the web page for Show Your Stripes gives you the opportunity to explore the temperatures in every country. And we see consistent changes in temperature. Everywhere we're warming up at different rates with different impacts, but it's happening everywhere. There's no way we could hide from climate change because the impacts are going to be there. Okay. So on to what is climate change? Well, there is scientific evidence of climate change. I think this is at the core of what we work with, this Society for Women in Science and Technology. This evidence has been collected following the, the most strict principles of the scientific method. And worldwide, there is agreement on significant differences in temperatures. Climate change is real. That's the baseline for our discussion. And we also are in agreement in the fact that it's anthropogenic in nature. We are causing it. We are, as humans, we as species are causing it. And one of the leading groups that is collecting and organizing and sharing this information is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a multinational interdisciplinary group of scientists that was charged and is still charged with assessing information on this topic. Their work is so relevant, so valuable, so solid that it won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. And this work has highlighted the significance of this, of this problem of climate change as a problem so much that the United Nations has a specific group of people working with it. Of course, has been for a long time. And currently the chair is Patricia Spinoza, a Mexican uh, scientist, a diplomat, who is carrying on with this work to get global collaboration to work against climate change. So the impacts on climate change are of course affecting our environment. And we as members of this environment will suffer these impacts. We'll, these are so significant that they'll affect our human health. And you can see in this animation from the Centers for Disease Control from the USA, how these specific impacts will be affecting or are affecting already each system of our body, right? So every physician, independently of their specialty, can tell you many things and can show you pieces of evidence about each one of these areas. So we see the increasing levels in carbon dioxide, the rising sea levels, the rising temperatures, and the more extreme weather, the more extreme weather events are affecting all of these elements of the environment, I, sorry, the secondary circle. And then we have specific areas in human health that are being affected. I won't cover all of them, of course, it would take much longer than the time we have, but I'll, I'll talk, that's why I chose these three specific areas, just to kind of uh, start 
this discussion on this and this uh, opportunity with you. So I encourage you to continue exploring this. These are many fields or many areas where you can find more knowledge and scientific evidence of what's happening. But let's start with respiratory health, with respiratory allergies and asthma that is connected not only with increasing allergens, pollen in the air, but also with increasing levels of air pollution. So moving on, we'll see this diagram. It's, it's not very pretty. I'm not a graphic designer by training. But at, at some point, I found myself trying to organize all the evidence I found around climate change and around the environmental elements and the human health outcomes. Like what are we exposed to and what are the outcomes in our health and how they come together. So I found that writing it down and organizing it into this little scheme helped me make it explicit. And then I, it was usually actually for my personal uh, use and then I found it helpful to continue the discussion. So what I want to highlight here is that yes, human activities are increasing the levels of air pollution. This is particulate matter concentrations. This is what we have in the air we breathe. And it's also increasing the levels of greenhouse gases. These also levels of air pollution. And all of these are connected to climate change and climate change is connected to increases in drought and increases in wildfires. So you see this kind of circle that brings us higher levels of ground level ozone. This, this is a, a component of the, what we breathe, the air we breathe. Good up high, bad nearby. It protects us from uh, the, the, rays, the sun rays uh, when it's in the upper layers of the atmosphere, but when it's closer to us, it's really negative for our respiratory health. And we are also seeing increases in the number of pollen grains in the air because of these increases in temperatures and increases in greenhouse gases. So there's more pollen in the air, the pollen season is lasting longer, and this combined with ozone and air pollution, well, the rest of the air pollution, is really affecting our health, our respiratory health, how we feel about it. Just go back to the past months, September, for example, when the wildfire season of this year happened in British Columbia. How did we feel? I, for one, had to stop running outside, which was something that was really helping my mental health, but it was not safe anymore. So for a couple of weeks, I had to stop doing that because the particulate matter concentrations in the air were really doing a number. And it would have been worse for me if I carried on running. And these high levels of air pollution were parts of the wildfires. We know that the number of wildfires is rising, is going up. And for many years, we have been documenting this and we see this evidence. And I know this slide talks about how the largest increases were seen in India and China, but air pollution knows no borders. Air pollution cares about well, it doesn't care, but it really spreads beyond borders. We saw this this year. Uh, the, the wildfires happened in the US and the air pollution traveled across the border to BC, to Alberta, and citizens of different countries had to cope with it and had to pull together resources to cope with this emergency, right? And we see that this emergencies are so serious, the impacts of these levels of air pollution and these components are so serious that they get all the way to deaths. The number of deaths due to air pollution is this number in the slide is so high. And we also see many other health outcomes such as asthma exacerbations. For example, there is very strong evidence from high quality studies done in BC that links the high concentrations of air pollution due to wildfires with trips to the ER due to asthma or medications dispensed to treat asthma. So there's a clear connection between having low levels of air quality and high numbers of people reaching out to, their, to the healthcare system to treat their symptoms. We are also seeing this, for example, in Australia, where, where the thunderstorms cause uh, um, really high numbers of people reaching out and having asthma exacerbations 
because the levels of pollen in the air really do a number on those who have sensitized uh, and who are allergic to pollen in the air to the point where their healthcare system uh, sometimes is overwhelmed because of the number of people who have to use the ambulances to reach their healthcare uh, systems, hospitals, emergency rooms, and so on and so forth. And we also have to keep in mind that tackling climate change, yes, it is serious, but tackling, tackling climate change will slash these numbers. There's a way out. We know that these are, there are actions that we can take specifically for these conditions. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But I want to leave you with, yes, this is a serious issue, but there's a way out. We'll, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Another area where we have seen an increase, because we have seen an increase in respiratory issues, is vector-borne diseases. There has been an ele about an 11% global increase in the vectorial capacity for transmission of dengue fever from just one type of mosquito over the past 60 years. And that is, for example, another emergency that was happening in 2020. Maybe he, here in Canada, we didn't have cases or that many cases of dengue fever, but in Latin America, the number of people who, who was diagnosed as suffering dengue fever, which is this infection, and it has serious health complications, was very high and very concerning, uh, to the point where specific health resources had to be allocated to treat and to prevent dengue fever and the spread of dengue fever in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So this kind of adds another layer of complexity. So we have the global emergency for climate change, the global emergency of pandemic, and specific conditions such as infections from dengue. And going into definitions, vector-borne diseases are infections transmitted by living organisms, the vectors, these disgusting, hideous, blood-sucking insects like ticks, you might be more familiar with those, this is a, a bug called the kissing bug that transmits chikungunya. And we also have mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti. That's the bane of my existence. I, in, in the city where I live, Cuernavaca, there were plenty of mosquitoes. And we know they carry malaria, Zika, uh, chikungunya, etc., and West Nile fever, of course. So these are two insects that I had the unpleasant experience to be in the same environment where they are. And they're part of that environment. And we are there in, in the same area, geographical area. And there are specific actions that we humans have to carry out for those. I remember my, one of my children coming back from school at six years of age telling me, oh, we saw a kissing bug today at school. They were aware of those and they were aware of the precautions they had to take and they had to stay away. And they knew a little bit about Chagas disease, just a little bit age appropriate material but at six years of age. So it's just part of the information and the adaptations we have to take for this. And the issue here with vector-borne diseases is that they account for 17% of all the infectious diseases worldwide, a very significant and concerning number. And we know that more than half of the world's population is currently at risk. These conditions have short-term and long-term impacts and in the past, most of the people who were at risk lived in, in more tropical areas. However, now we know that this is changing, not only because of the travel and the, the more opportunities for travel that ha were available before the pandemic. So you could get uh, infected with dengue or with Chagas and then travel back to your northern country and bring that, that infection with you. But we also know now that due to climate change, the insects that carry vector-borne diseases are extending their geographical range. So they're moving northwards. Areas that were previously so cool that they couldn't survive, that they couldn't thrive there, are now warmer. And the warmer seasons are lasting longer than in the past. So we are exposed to these insects for longer periods of time. Interesting tidbit here, it is suspected that Charles Darwin contracted Chagas disease when he traveled to, to, the, to South America with the beagle and then had to live for the rest of his life with the consequences of this infection. Just a bit of information. And 
now back to these current conditions, then we know that <clears throat> the number of vectors of eastern equine encephalitis, Lyme disease, and West Nile fever, these specific three conditions, are increasing in the USA and in some areas of Canada. And as I, I said before, I'm gonna drink some water here. This, talking about these insects gives me a, uh, this gut feeling, right? And this is one of the many feelings I get when I'm talking about health conditions. Honestly, some of the other health uh, conditions elicit more intense responses in me, are, cause me anxiety, cause me stress just to witness those. However, when you lift climate change, there are many other impacts on our mental health. And we know that the effects of climate change are among them extreme weather events. And surviving one of these weather events has a clear impact on the victims in many ways, but let's start uh, dealing with mental health, one of the many impacts. Uh, and these impacts are in the short, in the mid, and in the long term. We'll see this happening in the long term. This is a tweet just from last week. CBC was sharing how hurricanes are becoming more intense and dropping more rainfall than before, all due to climate change. This is on social media. The evidence is so clear that even our news corporations are sharing it on their social media. So meteorologists are sharing these pieces of evidence. I'm talking about one of them being hurricanes. We also know about wildfires, for example. And what we know in Canada specifically, in, a, in our neighboring province of Alberta, is for example, the impacts of the wildfires in the community of Fort McMurray. This uh, community that lived through these wildfires and that wildfires will be part of, of our normalcy in the future. They are projected to increase in frequency as the climate warms. And if, if we don't stop this trajectory, or if we don't help it to plateau and keep it within the limits set up by the Paris Agreement. What happens in the aftermath? Imagine living in the community where this picture was taken. Imagine being the, the firefighters who bravely uh, made it stop at some point, who saved some of the houses, who helped uh, evacuate the people from this community. How do you think you would feel afterwards? Many of you are professionals in health, so I know you know what are the impacts in mental health. And we know now that some of these mental health conditions uh, could be, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety. And we have to account for the different experiences, life experiences that people go through previously, before these, these disasters and afterwards. So bringing this lens of who you are into these, these uh, disasters would really help us to tailor the proper treatment and the proper allocation of resources in a more efficient way. Specifically for Canada, in Alberta, we know in, in mental health, we have evidence. Imagine living to this. This is a picture of the evacuation of Fort Murray. We have now evidence uh, and results of post-traumatic stress among evacuees uh, and impacts in their psychological and sleep symptoms, not only in adults, but in children. Significant increases in mental health symptoms in the children who live through this experience. So of course, this is, this is really hard for me to talk about. I, I can't help but feeling, oh, despair about it. It's, I can't even imagine living through one of these disasters. And the survivors have my utmost respect for, for the resilience and the strong community since they, they have this place. Um, and for the fight they've been fighting to recover. Uh, but, we have to see this and then what? Coming back, there, there's always an after. What happens after these disasters? What will happen after the pandemic? Then what? I don't want to leave you with a sense of doom and gloom, like, mm, and then what? There's nothing we can do. No, no, there's so much we can do. There's this doom and bloom. We already have discussed a path forward. We already know many actions that will help us mitigate 
climate change and improve our environments. This is a classic slide, a classic cartoon, because we know already that improving our environment in terms of energy independence, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, etc., will improve our, our environment and will also contribute to bring down or to, to mitigate climate change, mitigate being the key word. So it's a really a win-win situation, improving our environment for the well-being of all of us. This is a, a quote from Cristiana Figueres, one of the architects of the Paris Agreement and now chair of this commission that I've been sharing images with you, the Lancet Countdowns Advisory Board. And she says that tack tackling climate change directly, unequivocally and immediately improves global health. It's as simple as that. So we have these parallel benefits. Solving the global emergency of climate change will benefit us all if we add equity to the lens of and to the solutions we're working. And we are already seeing some of this. Some in the scientific community, we're seeing increased awareness and many more research projects working on this. We have seen triple, three times the number of scientific publications in a decade working on climate change, exploring, trying to figure out answers to these wicked problems and these complex diagrams around all the elements of climate change. So many people, many research teams are pulling their expertise together to see the path forward. And when I think about the path forward, I don't know if you've seen it, but in the news, I've seen a lot of people so saying that after the pandemic, I want to go back to how things were. I, I, I've also seen people saying, I don't want to go back to how things were. There were many things that could be improved from the way things were before. Let's not bounce back. Let's bounce forward. We have seen from the pandemic, all of the potential things, all of the potential actions, resources, personal that can be brought together. So we can confidently ask to bounce forward, to move forward and to improve this. And we are seeing evidence of this. Many cities are starting to prepare for climate change. 69% of cities across the world are currently developing or have already completed a climate change risk assessment. Many cities in Canada and BC are part of this percentage. And of course, these assessments are done following a standardized procedure, science-based, evidence-based procedure. So there's a movement already uh, coming together or already came together to contribute in this fight against climate change. Personally, I think that what can we do? What can I humbly suggest we, we get involved? Well, first of all, let's keep talking about it. This is Catherine Hayhoe. She has a TED talk, a really good TED talk. And she's the speaker I told you about that uh, was invited to Pint of Science. And the key message of, of her climate change talk is keep talking about it, keep raising awareness, keep mobilizing all of these people that gathered uh, with Greta Thunberg last time she came to Vancouver. Wow, this is amazing. The fact that you uh, allocated some time today, it's amazing because you are putting your resources, a super valuable resource, which is time to talk about climate change. And then we also can, we can keep learning about it. This is one of the webinars from a series I'm part of. Uh, I'm involved in the knowledge translation. And in that web page, I'll share with you later the, the address. There are many recordings of experts who came together to see how their fields of expertise, for example, HIV or attention to mental health or respiratory health, are, is faring in the light of the global emergency of climate change and the global emergency of the pandemic. So many fields of expertise were analyzed together and the recordings and the slides are in that web page. and we are preparing a toolkit of materials to keep learning and to keep sharing the expertise of these presenters and, and how they're seeing a path forward, right? A way out of this emergency. And lastly, in the things that I suggest you do, well, if you haven't already, let's take more environmentally friendly choices. And I know that the pandemic limiting 
uh, the choices we can take because safety comes first, of course. So we might not be able to use our reusable cups at a coffee shop. That's okay, but let's try to recycle. If you're able to use a reusable face mask instead of a disposable and to safely clean it and, and be aware of all the proper practices, let's do it. Let's try these little changes in our everyday uh, activities. And also use your power as voter, as customer, as employee, as volunteer, as member. You have a voice. You contribute to all of these organizations. Let's keep learning. For example, this is a, an article that came up in Chatelaine last year in the, in the context of the election. And Catherine Hayhoe, this expert I told you about, she's Canadian, and she and Andrew Leach compare the four federal parties' climate plans and assess them and actually graded them. They're a university professor, so they enjoy giving grades out. Um, it's a very thorough analysis of these platforms. And I think it's a good piece of information to take when you're exercising your vote, when you're choosing who to vote for and using this power. So the way out already has scientific evidence supporting these choices. Let's enact those and let's keep powering together to bounce forward. And that's it for me, but Christine and, and Adele, I'm leaving it up to you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for that fantastic, very educational and very inspiring talk. Um, so we will be getting into a set of breakout rooms um, to give you all the chance to talk a little bit more about the presentation and share any thoughts that you have um, just before the Q&A section. And then we'll come back all together for the Q&A and for the closing portion of this Brownback session. I had a question about vaccination. Mm -hmm. um, um, do we have vaccination for the dengue fever and the other vector borne diseases? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure about that. I would have to do more research on that. Oh, we don't in Canada because we don't have it as a disease here. So in Canada, dengue fever and that kind of vaccine is not part of the BC or Canadian plan. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. Randy. Thank you, Randy. Uh, hi, Celia. Cecilia. Hi. Uh, this is Dr. Sattar speaking. Uh, this is another issue, another point of issue that I'm talking, as I'm thinking about, is the uh, room temperature. Uh, the room temperature and the living area that people are, uh, in, uh, are living in the winter, uh, they are trying to um, to put their home in very, to, uh, to um, make their home very warm. You know, mm -hmm. um, when I see in, the, uh, in my neighbors or my friends, when I go to their home, it's, it's very hot, very warm. Uh, it's actually this is the habit that the people are following it, especially during the winter, mm -hmm. uh, that um, they live in their home as the summer. <laughs> they, they, they deny, yeah, they deny to put on any things, and, and and actually it was very interesting your uh, speech that you have focused on the um, global warming and the temperature on the respiratory system. And uh, back to my major as genetics, I know that when you uh, when you make environment very warm, it will affect on your respiratory system. Mm -hmm. and, and susceptibility to the allergics also. So I think another approach that can people follow is uh, make their homes um, less warmer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. actually eight, 18 degree to 22 is enough, but they, also I think they are 30 in their home. Oh my God. And over, I, when they, when they do this, all the whole warmer and warmer, the global warming is another issue that uh, will go during the time. More fuel and more gas and yeah, more energy to keep the warm only in the winter. Yeah. I, I'm worried about that too because there's more energy consumption 
if either if you're warming up your house during the winter or mm -hmm. cooling it down with, during the summer, right? And it could become a vicious circle where we consume more energy. And if this energy is not clean energy, then we are polluting more. And you see the circle, we're contributing yeah, exactly. to greenhouse gases and climate change. However, there's a way out of this. If we opt and we advocate for clean energy and for these little behaviors, like wearing a sweater, mm -hmm. wearing another layer mm -hmm. or opening the windows, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. then we're opting for this path out of the vicious circle. This, so, so we have this social involvement of advocating for clean energies mm -hmm. and the, the personal involvement of I'm having another layer, right, yeah. for, for keeping myself warm. Yes, and, and but it's a situation for me when you talk about respiratory system and the, and the warming that will affect the respiratory system and they're susceptible to the allergics and other disease. Yeah, yeah so it has a both advanced advantages if the people follow you, uh, using energy more uh, um, better than. Yes, better, better cleaner options. And yeah. I, I can tell you, for example, during this last wildfire season, I, I got myself an air purifier for my house, right? So that was one more appliance that was using electricity and power in my house. And it had to be done. I, I don't judge people who get their AC, for example, or, or their furnace going on because it's your everyday quality of life, right? Yeah, exactly. But I Actually, still... our home, I didn't, didn't turn off any electricity. I did my neighbors are made more warm and worse too, but my home is completely warm because of my neighbor. <laughs> oh, I hear you. Oh, well, the, the, that's yeah. another, a, a silver lining. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know what they are doing at home. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm trying to suggest personal options, right? So... Yeah. If we get another layer of clothing, yeah. more power to us. Yeah, right? so, so I think if you uh, you find a so you propose a solution such as reusable cup and something like this, please enter this choice to the to your speech. I think it will be helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I actually have a question as well for you, Cecilia. Um, so you talked a lot about a lot of the different uh, consequences of climate change that are happening all over the world, like air pollution and water contamination, which you didn't go into extensively. And there were a whole lot more on the wheel that you showed. Um, and obviously the increase of the factor of diseases and whatnot. Um, which one do you think tends to affect like public health in Canada the most, specifically in Canada? Oh, oh there, are, there are so many things that we could deal. Uh, I think if we keep up uh, an eye on the more local issues, it's better than, than a national issue. Of course, as a country, Canada is warming up at, at a fastest rate because of the geographical location. But each province and each municipality has a specific issue. We know, for example, in BC, there has been an increase in waterborne diseases, right? There's evidence uh, of that. And before I, I say this is an issue for Canada, I would like to see evidence in the other provinces. So we know, for example, um, some communities in the North experience solastalgia, this impact in their mental health because of their climate change, these sustained changes in their environment that really affect how you feel, right? So those are two of the issues for example, and I already talked about the asthma exacerbations due to wildfires in Canada and the infections in Ontario. So um, I think I, I would like to see a kind of a provincial list rather than a national. Yeah, I'm sure Canada is obviously a very large territory with a lot of different ecosystems on it. So I'm sure it's a pretty difficult question. Okay, do we have any other questions? Oh, I had a question as well. So, um, hi, um, so I know like a lot of, like we were talking in the previous question about people will have different issues and like different types of responses. So 
So like I know for like I know the city of Surrey, for example, has like high sea levels that is gonna be a concern for them because the city of Surrey has like the ocean near White Rock and then also the Fraser River near like Surrey Central area. And I know that they've been working actively on like the mitigation strategies of what to do when when those rises occur eventually. But like also I don't think the other cities have necessarily gone gone to that step yet, whether they're, they're looking for mitigation strategies or what should happen. So like, what do you think would like, this, how should like people come together? Like, you know, I know that there's different issues, but then some issues overlap. And like, how does like everybody respond the same way? Because I find that a lot of people don't have the same information, even like things like, you know, layer up instead of turning your feet up isn't something someone's gonna like naturally think of. But mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of like communication and like knowledge missing outside mm -hmm. of just like the education, like talks and things like that with that we come to, not like people who should be doing these things don't get to hear that. Mm -hmm. I I hope I, I got your question right because the audio was uh, giving me a hard time here. I think coming together from a strength-based strength, strength based perspective is a, pro, a very productive first step. What mm -hmm. are the strengths that the communities already have in place? What, if, if you have that a community has a strong social network or if a community already has some resources in place that foster their resilience, that could be a great starting point. And it always has to be linked to the communities like do you know that saying that nothing for us without us yeah pretty much that has to be the starting point yeah. um, and yes we'll see many different perspectives for sure um, some people get very passionate about their their individual perspectives but i think using this strength based approach can help the dialogue and saying yes you bring this to the table and you feel very passionate about it. How about we use your passion, right? Instead of, of kind of pointing fingers and saying, you are thinking a different thing that I'm thinking, right? I, like, I don't like this finger pointing approach. And I, I've seen some very good results coming from places of, of acknowledging everyone's strengths and everyone's rich and vast experience. Great. Um, thank you so much, Cecilia, for your great presentation and for your um, answers. And thank you to every participant for attending this brown bag session. Um, so I invite you all to join us again at the same time next week for another brown bag session titled uh, Race is Not a Risk Factor for Chronic Disease. Um, there are also two other events happening this Friday evening. Um, and I, I encourage you all to go check out our website and um, see what those are and if you're interested in taking part in them. Um, and finally, I will ask you, I would like to ask you all to please fill out the event evaluation feedback survey um, that has been sent to all of the registered members. So if you registered for this um, session ahead of time, it will automatically be sent to your email. Um, it's very useful for us to uh, have a chance to understand what, what is liked and what is disliked about these sessions and to improve our events. Um, yeah, so thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day.